I want you to close your eyes and picture a pyramid, a pyramid that has four layers. The big bottom layer, and then there's three more layers on top, and it gets to the pointy end as it gets to the top. This pyramid is a pyramid of data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. The big bottom layer is the layer of raw data, which needs context added to it to turn it into information. When you move up a layer, this information is then distilled by subject matter experts, and they add meaning to it, which then turns it into knowledge. You move further up the layer, this knowledge is then used to derive insights, which then turns into wisdom, which then informs policy and decision-making. I'm a data specialist who works in the bottom layer, the raw data, a bit of cut and dry um, topic, but that's where I primarily work. Now imagine this pyramid in the context of infectious diseases. A data specialist like me needs to understand all these layers of this pyramid. I also need to understand the bottom layer the best, the systems that generate the data, how different those systems are, how the formatting of the data is quite different, how to best aggregate it, make those systems talk to each other, so the next layers, the subsequent layers, can make best use of that data. So in my role, I work with clinicians, public health researchers, public health practitioners, epidemiologists, we all know what they do now, um, and those people work with policymakers. So let's focus on the bottom layer of this pyramid, the raw data, and how it contributes to pandemic preparedness and response. What happens when someone develops symptoms as a result of an infection? They first go get a test. Testing is really important to understand, measure, and mitigate the burden of infectious diseases in the community. These testing capac capacities should be accurate, reliable, sustainable, and available nationally to people. We all know about diagnostics tests now. We know about the PCR testing for COVID that measures the virus's genetic material. We have also heard about genomics, the fancy term that tells us where the variants have emerged from and where they're going. It has, genomics has become the fastest way to identify pathogens, also understand transmission pathways. Where has it come from? Where would it be going? Fun fact, when I was doing my undergrad and postgrad training in bioinformatics, which is, a, which is a discipline that combines biological sciences, computer science, and statistics, I was able to learn lab techniques such as PCR and also genomics data analysis. One of the lab techniques that I studied was gel electrophoresis, where fragments of DNA, RNA, and small molecules are pulled through a matrix of gel through electricity and get separated according to size. Those experiments took over a little over a day, and finally we got to see those fragments under UV light, which made me realize something really important, how bored I was seeing those fragments. <laughs> because I have a very short attention span. So I decided to stick to the other part of my training, which is genomics data analysis. That allowed me to switch between projects, use different tools, debug codes, and evaluate systems and evaluate programs not realizing that debugging can actually take over multiple days, a lot more than the gel electrophoresis experiment. I have made my choice now. <laughs> when I was training as a bioinformatician in 2008, I was working on DNA, RNA, and protein sequences, but I never knew the small niche area of biomedical data analytics will be a critical part of the toolkit for a global pandemic response. Speaking of attention span, coming back to the other types of data that contributes to pandemic preparedness and response. After testing comes the public health surveillance part. These systems are quite essential because they give us early estimates of how transmissible a virus is, particularly in milder cases, as they do not present to the hospital. Which means if there is no data collection happening outside of the hospital, we would miss a huge chunk of the mild cases, which is why the, the uh, surveillance is really, really important. Because it monitors the spread of the disease, identifies patterns of transmission, as well as disease progression and informs what public health measures are needed to control the spread. When a person's symptoms do get severe, they present at the hospital, which then kicks off a big chain of data collection. As an example, if they present at the emergency, the information about the state of the patient is collected, their demographics, comorbidities, risk factors, um, and there are also tests that are done, following which if they're admitted to the hospital, or in worst cases in the ICU, there is daily data collection that happens that allows the um, clinician 
to monitor their um, state, which includes treatment, medications, chest x-rays in this case, and other types of information. This data set is not only valuable for the clinician to monitor severe cases, but is also forming a rich resource for us researchers to go back and investigate disease severity, outcomes, and patterns of hospitalization. And that's a resource that I'm trying to leverage. The last but not the least is contextual information about risk factors in vulnerable populations that are more likely to experience a higher burden of disease. What are those risk factors? What is the history? Has the risk factor been collected to stigmatize communities or actually are we trying to help them? Was this information collected in an ethical way? Is this information being used in an ethical way? So engagement with vulnerable populations needs to be well integrated into the other three types of data collection that I mentioned, which is the clinical, which is happening in the hospitals, public health surveillance, and testing lab data. So the vulnerable populations who are at higher risk receive the best possible care. So in summary, we go back to thinking about the pyramid of data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, and how each part distills more information for the other part. The big bottom layer of the pyramid consists of data from diagnostic labs, genomics, public health, surveillance, clinical settings, and contextual information about vulnerable populations. It sounds complex, doesn't it? This layer not only collects information from varied settings, but also from different technological systems it just makes it so much harder to aggregate everything. And that's where people like me step in to look at the systems, make sure the data is harmonized so you can make sense of it when everything is aggregated. Because this data can also be bound by specific governance mechanisms, which is a bit boring, but quite essential. And that's another challenge that I work through. That was a lot to take in for everyone, the ecosystem, but I'll put everything in context by telling you about two very interesting COVID-19 projects that I'm involved in. When specimens, the swabs that we give, are collected as a part of testing, surveillance, treatment, or even research, the individual from whom we're collecting the specimens can provide consent for further use of those specimens for research. But how would researchers find those specimens? Where are they located? What are the storage requirements? What is the consent information associated with it? What temperatures do those specimens need to be stored? To solve this problem, I'm working with an amazing set of co colleagues to develop a virtual biobank portal for COVID-19 specimens. This virtual biobank will enable the discovery of data related to biospecimens across institutions and locations in Australia. And I'm working on the information modeling component of the project. So when the end user will query our portal, pieces of code carrying the search terms will go and query the source systems that are present around Australia that manage specimens and bring that data together in an aggregated format. But how would it present information that looks very different and is formatted differently? That's where information modeling comes in place. I've developed a minimum information model that captures few but very essential data fields that all these systems capture. Basically a language that allows systems to talk to each other. So this minimum information model goes with the query, pulls the information and presents it in an aggregate format, which is harmonized and you can make sense of it. I'm very excited for this portal to go live, which will happen soon, once we work through the governance. Um, and I can't wait for it to go live and see how the research community responds to it. The other project that I'm working on is a clinical data linkage platform that allows potential participants to consent to or decline participation in COVID-19 projects dynamically, which means if they say yes to being a part of the platform, doesn't necessarily mean that they've consented to all projects that come through. We will be sending them proposals and they can look at it and, and decline that participation in a project if they're not happy with it. This platform will ethically and securely link data from consented individuals uh, that's present in the electronic medical records, um, the diagnostics lab, ICU, emergency, and other clinical research platforms based within the hospital. We have some fantastic research questions lined up, and we've recruited about 200 people. So fingers crossed, the recruitment process keeps going and we can get more information. Um, so our research questions are pertaining to long COVID, as well as understanding hospitalization outcomes caused by different variants of the virus. I will hopefully be able to talk about that findings in another episode. <laughs> In the last five years of being a data specialist in this niche area of pandemic preparedness and response, there are some things that I have learned. I call it making better decisions for data so the data can make better decisions for us. Because as we have seen, information is the fuel that drives the vehicle of pandemic response. 
we should make sure that these information systems are ready during peacetime to be ramped up and is giving us valuable information to strengthen our overall preparedness towards infectious disease emergencies. A good example is how systems set up for influenza were leveraged, repurposed for COVID-19 pandemic. We must learn to break out of silos and integrate valuable pieces of information together, as I explained in the context of the pyramid, to fully understand the picture. There is a genuine need for investment into infrastructure, skills, people like me, collaborations for health system to strengthen preparedness. So we have a strong caring health system for the public and are well equipped to respond to the next pandemic, which may not be too far away. Thank you.